Welcome to our Summerlin Church video for this week. I'm glad you're here. I'm David Muscofi and Caker, and I serve the team as the associate pastor. Bart's talk is coming up. Kathleen's prepared awesome worship music. I hope you love it all. As a church, we're a community of people who are learning to live and to love more like Jesus lived and loved, and I invite you into that journey with us. I, as I've been checking in with folks, I've been grateful to hear the ways in which you're all checking in with one another and you're praying with one another. I can invite you to keep doing that. If you're thinking of calling someone, go ahead and do it. Pick up the phone and call them. It'd be great. And thank you for your ongoing contributions to our church. All those donations are done online on our website. Click the donate link and that allows us to continue to serve our community. Thanks in advance for those gifts. As we head into this video, my prayer for you is that you experience God's rich love for you. You can make a space in this time for you to know God's love more fully. Last Sunday was, of course, the big Sunday, Easter Sunday, and even though we couldn't gather together in a physical way, which I, I do greatly miss, uh, we celebrated the resurrection of Jesus, which really is such a marvelous memory in our consciousness to know we remember that Jesus had a deathless love, and the resurrection tells us that love is in itself deathless. It, it wins the victory. So it, it calls us into a whole new realm of possibility in this life, but, but also in the next life. But today, we're going to start a series on the Spirit. We're going to actually talk about Pentecost, uh, which you don't tend to think of Presbyterians talking about Pentecost, but I'm going to do it. We're going to talk about the Holy Spirit. And 
when we remember the resurrection, it's the physical Jesus that we're thinking about, the actual Jesus of Nazareth. And we remember and we're thankful for all that he did, all that he taught, all that he suffered. But with Pentecost, we're talking about the spirit. And we remember Jesus in the resurrection, but we experience the Holy Spirit. We, we don't just remember the Holy Spirit. We actually experience the Holy Spirit and we're transformed. With, with Jesus, we remember the resurrection and we're thankful. But with the Spirit, we experience the Spirit and we're transformed either gradually or all at once. I would say 99% of us, it's a gradual transformation. So I want to look at the great passage about the giving of the Spirit. It's in Acts chapter 2. And... Uh, Acts was written by Luke, who also wrote the Gospel of Luke. And he recounts that Jesus is talking to his disciples. And he says this, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift of the Father, the gift that the Father promised, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't think they had any idea what he was talking about. I think they were scratching their heads wondering. But he did say, don't leave and wait. And so they didn't leave Jerusalem and they waited. About 120 of them were gathered together when the following happened. When the day of Pentecost came, which by the way is a Jewish holiday, all of the early disciples of Jesus were Jewish. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together, it's 120 of them, in one place and suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting and they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each one of them and all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them. Now, there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because they heard each, each one heard these men speaking in their own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that each of us hears our own native language, languages, Parthenians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt and Rome, Cretans and Arabs. And we hear these declaring the wonders of God in our own language. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they've had too much wine. I, I, I love the scriptures. They're just so down to earth. Uh, this was a completely unexpected occurrence. Uh, no one dreamed this was going to happen. They didn't quite understand, in fact, what was happening. But I want to look at a couple elements of it. And as I mentioned, we're going to do a whole series on the Spirit. And today is more of an entry-level uh, conversation about it. Later, we're going to look at the characteristics of the Holy Spirit over the weeks ahead. Well, the two obvious ones are there's wind and there's fire. Uh, this mighty wind comes in, says it fills the whole room. It had a loud noise. And you think about wind, which by the way, the, the word spirit in the Hebrew is the same word for breath. In fact, we're going to look a little uh, in a little later in this talk about how Jesus actually used his own breath to impart the Spirit at one time. So wind, air, breath is all in the same kind of feeling, and it nourishes. Think of what oxygen does. Think of what air does. You're not even aware of it, but it, but it nourishes you. That's something about the Spirit as well. The Spirit nourishes us. It freshens us. You know, you, you, you get out your, your old set of pajamas and you hang them outside for a little while and they're just like new and ready to go. They smell better, they, they feel better, they're crisp. Air, wind, breath, it's all about life. The second element is fire. Now, fire is a little scarier. Fire burns. Fire can bring pain. 
But when you think about the symbolism of the early uh, church, the the fire symbolized a purifying effect. Uh, that doesn't mean it didn't hurt. You know, you purify metal by heating it up to a very high degree. It, it also has a, the element of burning away anything that's unnecessary or even harmful. And that's true of the spirit as well. The spirit is meant to burn away in our lives anything that's just not needed or, or that's actually harmful or cumbersome and gets in the way. So we learn a few things about this. The, the wind, it's mighty, it's invisible, but it's a force you can feel. You, you can feel the wind. And the spirit is the same. It's not just a memory of something that happened or a, a theological construct or a doctrine where we say, I believe that Jesus was the son of God. It's not just that. You can feel it. You can feel the spirit. I remember talking to a very famous preacher who's now passed away, a Roman Catholic Franciscan named Brennan Manning. And uh, we were talking one day and he said, he said, Bart, I can tell you one thing. People are not transformed until they've had an emotional experience, until they've felt God in their hearts. They may think they've been changed, but actually only their ideology gets changed. It's when the love of Christ, the love of God, comes to them through the Spirit and they feel it, that true transformation happens. So this wind was not only a symbol, but uh, a reality of what it felt like to those early who were ex early disciples who were experiencing this. And it was unexpected. Uh, I was just finishing a book at the back of the North Wind by George MacDonald, and one of the statements in it, uh, the North Wind is a symbol of the Holy Spirit in this book, and, and interesting that it's wind. And, and the author is saying to the little boy who's waiting to experience this, he says, oh, it never comes when you're expecting it. And there's a bit of that truth with the Holy Spirit as well. They, they were just gathered together. Now, they were gathered together in obedience to what Jesus said, wait until this promise comes. And they were gathered with open minds and open hearts. And that's something we can do. We can, we can gather ourselves together. The Spirit is usually given not just in an individual sense, but in, in a gathered community is often the place it happens. It's a transcendent experience. Let's face it, this was an amazing experience. They all started speaking languages they didn't apparently know. And others heard their native language coming through these Galileans, these northern people from the north part of Israel who had a distinctive accent that would be almost like, uh, we might say, a country bumpkin accent. And that's why they said, who are these Galileans talking so fluently in these other languages? It was transcendent experience. It was a mystical experience. I mentioned fire, the cleansing, the purifying. But this experience was also a universal experience. Think about it. All these other, you heard me try to read the list properly of these different countries were represented. What's the symbolism here? It, it's God's love through the Holy Spirit is meant for all people. And it's not only universal, it's very personal. They heard these men and women declaring the glory of God in their own language. See, God is always personal. God wants to bring it to you in your first language, in your own culture, in your own family. It's intimate in that sense. And then finally, although I didn't read this portion, the result is that uh, Peter gets up and tells the glory of Jesus Christ and the resurrection with great boldness. And he was anything but bold before this moment. There was a transformation into boldness, and that is a work of the Spirit. I'd like to look at one other passage that has to do with the giving of the Spirit. It's, it's John's version of it in the Gospel of John. He gives a little different, um, these may have been two different incidents, but you have to remember this was an oral storytelling culture. And so their stories were uh, profoundly significant in, in both symbolism and, 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 and meaning and wisdom. And he says this, on the evening of that first day of the week, this is after Jesus had risen, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and he said, peace be with you. And after that, he, after he'd said that, he showed them his hands and his side, the wounds. 
Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father sent me, I'm sending you. And with that, he breathed on them. And he said, receive the Holy Spirit. He breathed on them. What an odd situation. Quite different than the other setting. The other setting was 120 people. This apparently was a smaller band of the disciples. A very intimate uh, setting behind a locked door, literally. Intimate setting. And an intimate gesture. He says, peace. I'm bringing you shalom, he probably would have said in Hebrew. It doesn't just mean cessation of of conflict. It means uh, well-being, wholeness, completeness. He says, peace be to you. And then he says, receive the Holy Spirit. And he, he breathed on him. Now, this is a very intimate scene. I mean, you breathe on a lover, you, you breathe on somebody you love. You're that close. You're so close you can feel their breath. This is a, a transformation that comes about in intimacy. So the Holy Spirit is about all of those things. Fire to purify. Uh, uh, the whole idea of air uh, to freshen, to come in with strength and that you feel it. And it's meant to bring about this inner transformation. Now, one thing you have to ask is, well, how do we experience that? I mean, that sounds nice. And the very first thing we have to look at with this is you can't manipulate it. I mean, they didn't try to get wind machines there or little flame machines that would put a flame up over their head. I mean, there's there's no way to make this happen, but you can Make yourself ready so that when it happens, you realize it's there. You can do that, I'm going to suggest four ways, very simple ways, so simple. You can open yourself. Just open yourself to something greater than your own understanding at this point. Open yourself to God. Uh, Throw away some of your preconceptions of God. Throw away some other people's preconceptions of God. I I see other people's preconceptions or theological viewpoints have kept so many people from actually experience what is right there around them ready to be experienced. Set those aside and open your mind. Open your heart. That's number one, open. Number two, surrender yourself. Not, not just be open to it, but surrender yourself over to the possibility of a, of a deeper experience of spirit. Three, I call it rigging your sails. You know, uh, sailors can't make the wind blow, but they can have their sails ready to hoist when the wind is blowing. So we need to be rigging our sails. We need to be doing some spiritual exercises, just like if you want to uh, throw a football 100 yards, you've you got to be in the gym working on your strength. You, you can't be a good athlete unless you work hard to, uh, so that you're ready when the big game comes. Rigging our sails spiritually. What if we spend no time thinking spiritually? Praying, meditating, uh, silence, solitude, spiritual reading, and I mean good reading, being with others who are pursuing a spiritual path, having a community. Those are ways we rig our sails so that when the Spirit wants to breathe like a mighty wind, come in like a mighty wind or, or breathe like an intimate breath, we're ready to receive it. So rig your sails. Find some spiritual practices that make you a person who will recognize what's happening when it comes. And then finally, wait. Just wait. You know, Jesus said to the disciples, don't leave the city and wait for the promised spirit. Uh, Just wait. And while you're waiting, do some good things. You you don't have to wait for some big spiritual experience to go help your neighbor or, or to be kind to somebody or to forgive somebody, to do the things you already know are right so that when this moment comes, which might be a lot of small moments over a large period of time, or for some people, it comes in a big you know, moment like this, like Pentecost. But go about doing good while you're waiting. You have to remember these disciples had been with Jesus three years. They were rigging their sails. They'd done a lot of interior work to be ready for this moment. They'd been with him three years. They'd been disillusioned by his death. 
Then there was the ecstasy of his resurrection. And then they're told to wait. I mean, that, was, that might have been the hardest part. And then the baptism came. He said, oh, they'll be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, the word baptism uh, has, has been transliterated over into English. It, it actually meant drenching, soaking, uh, uh, dunking, immersing one. So he says, you'll be immersed in the Holy Spirit when this happens. Uh, teacher I really enjoy, Jim Finley, has a wonderful analogy. He says, if you're walking out into the ocean and you get up to your ankles, you can't say you're completely covered with the ocean, but you are completely in the ocean. And if you go a little further, you're a little further in the ocean, but you're all this time you've been in the ocean. And if you get up to here, you're, you can be fully said that you are in the ocean. You're maybe just not fully in it. And I think it's a, a beautiful image that as we grow in our spiritual life, uh, sometimes it's like wading out into the ocean and then you get to the point where your feet come off, off the floor of the ocean and you get to swim, you're drenched in what I called earlier this deathless, self-forgetful love. So I'd like us to open up our hearts to do that uh, in these next few weeks as we consider it. Uh, following Jesus Christ, but being drenched and immersed in his spirit. Thank you.